I'm really excited to introduce today's speaker, Jan Blakely. Jan Blakely Holman is Director of Advisor Education at Thornburg Investment Management. She is responsible for identifying and creating advisor education programs that support financial advisors as they work with their clients and prospects. Jan has spent 44 years in the financial service industry. Over the course of her career, she served as a financial advisor, an advisor to financial advisors, and a financial services corporate executive. Jan is a frequent presenter at broker, dealer, and industry conferences where she discusses women in investing, women in transition, longevity planning, and managing legacy wealth. She has also written numerous articles and contributed to several books on these and other financial planning topics. A strong believer in the importance of the financial advisor investor relationship throughout her career, Jan has demonstrated a passion for helping consumers understand the off putting language of financial services. An avid skier, photographer, and novice silversmith, Jan's career at Thornburg has enabled her to achieve her goal of living life on purpose by doing rewarding and meaningful work while enjoying the beautiful moment mountains of Santa Fe. I love that. Um, a mother of three and a grandmother of two. She lives with her two puppies, Dobby, a basset hound, and Tigger, a great Dane. Jan has a BA in political science from the University of Denver. And I'm Nicole. I will be moderating today's conversation. And I am the associate marketing manager at Power to Fly. Um, and I'm really excited to be here. And I definitely resonate with everything you said about all, you know, the off-putting language of the financial services industry. So really excited to dive in. Um, and so welcome, Jan. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's nice to see you. It is nice to see you too. And I love the microphone. Oh my gosh, this is, this is going to be great. Um, this is fantastic. So diving into today's conversation, can you tell us a bit more about your career journey? I know I covered a bunch in there, um, but anything that I missed and how you became involved in finance, given that your BA is in political science? Oh, Nicole, I was shocked, shocked when I graduated from college in four years. This was the 1970s and I thought I was gonna be there for about 20 years. Um, obviously I didn't plan well and my parents were very pleased that I graduated right on time after four years. When I went back to Minnesota where I'm from, um, my father informed me that he didn't think I was marketable for anything, even though I had a degree from the University of Denver. And you know what, he was probably right. So he made me go to typing school and shorthand school. And he said, well, if nothing else, you can become a secretary. Imagine, can you imagine somebody's father saying that to them now? Um, so I did go to typing school and shorthand school. And actually I'm glad I went to typing school because I could type really fast. And since I write a lot, it's become very important. Anyway, so I had to get a job and I wound up walking into this, you know, uh, employment agency in the skyways of Minneapolis and applied for a job at Piper Jaffrey and Hopwood, which is now Piper Jaffrey. Um, at that point, it was a broker dealer and they had advisors or brokers, we called ourselves then, and uh, wound up getting the job. So there I was. And let me tell you something. I didn't even know when I got into the business that if you divide the top number of a fraction by the bottom number, you get a percent. So I had a lot of work to do. So that's how oh. I got in. That's how I got into the business. I love your story and I so resonate with the first part about college because I remember every single day I was in college, I hated, hated college. And I'm so glad I'm not there anymore. Um, and there's so much that I learned about college along the way, but I, uh, oh, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and uh, wow, okay, so you've learned a lot, you've grown a lot, and now you're the Director of Advisor Education at Thornburg Investment Management. So can you tell us a little bit more about your role? And I mean, like, can you talk about some of the growth that you've had personally moving up? Oh, sure. Um, what's really interesting, and uh, probably a lot of people that I work with don't know this is, uh, well, they do know that I have a lot of designations, like six. Now, the reason, Nicole, I have six designations is because of my confidence level. 
and coming out of college being prepared to do nothing except be fun at a party, right? Um, I needed to believe that I had knowledge. So that's one of the things that I have focused on during my career. Um, as director of advisor education at Thornburg, what I do is create programs and, um, and presentations for financial advisors. And they're typically focusing on how advisors can obtain, acquire, and retain, retain clients and assets, because this is an exceptionally competitive business now. It wasn't as competitive when I started. In fact, I was the only woman in a, uh, a bullpen at Payne Weber in Minneapolis with 77 guys. So I've been in the business when there were no women. And I'm really happy that there are women, but we need more women, a lot more. We need uh, people of color. Uh, when, when people who are not in this industry look at us, we don't look like people out there. We kind of look like a bunch of middle-aged men and some women here and there. And we need people who look like consumers in order to attract those people to financial advisors. Because I'm a believer that people must have a financial advisor. It's critical. I think it's such an important point that you make um, because, you know, as somebody with very little financial service, like industry lingo down just over the past year, I started reading a lot. And it's actually thanks to one of my colleagues who is a prior uh, financial advisor. And it wasn't until I started talking to her that I was able to feel a little bit more comfortable dipping into the realm, right? And there's so many things that are confusing, like a Roth IRA, a Roth IRA, a 401k, all of these different things, all of these investment places. And when you talk about this competitiveness between financial advisors, and I'm going to guess also there's a, there's a competitive edge here when it comes to all of these new technologies that are coming out, right? Which makes it a lot easier to invest and it, it can make the user who maybe isn't so familiar feel a little bit more in control of their investments and of where their money is going, right? Because maybe there's a sense of like distrust saying, I want you to tell me how to manage my money, right? Or we get defensive when someone wants to tell us how to manage our, our, our spending, our budget, all of that, of course. So I want you to talk about, or I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the importance of having a financial advisor um, and building that relationship. And, and on, on a, a follow-up to that, of finding a good financial advisor. Um, first, I'll address the finding an advisor. I think ask people that you trust, um, people you know who work with a financial advisor and who have talked about the, the wonderful relationship they have with their financial advisor. So first talk to people, get some names and go interview those people. And as you said, one of the most important things is to make sure that the person you meet with speaks your language, not this language like real language, language so that I, as a consumer, can understand this. Because you can't get away from it. People have to invest. They really don't have a choice if they want to acquire things or achieve goals in the future. So in order to do that, you want to work with somebody who knows how to do it. Now related to working with a financial advisor. I often wonder why people think that this is something they can do on their own. Um, you know, I don't believe that I can test DNA in my house and figure out if somebody's DNA matches the fingerprints on my window. I can't do that. The only person who I've ever known to have operated on themselves was my ex-husband's uncle who gave himself a vasectomy. Now, that said, 
That's kind of scary, isn't it? He was a heart surgeon. But what if he sneezed or something? This is dangerous stuff. You don't want to be doing that, right? So you want somebody who does this for a living, not somebody who's goofing around with it. The other thing is the breadth of knowledge. It's not just investing, it's also insurance. Do I need excess disability insurance? Do I need long-term care insurance? Do I need pet insurance? Do you know what I mean? Making decisions like that are part of financial planning. And those are not the sexy parts of money. The fun and sexy part is making money on a stock that goes up, right? Well, you got to do the other stuff too, because that area, the area where we have risks can come back and bite us if we haven't made conscious decisions about whether or not we should insure against risks. Because if you don't insure against risks and you have to pay out on a loss, you're going to often have to dip into the money that you've invested. So you're just negating any progress you've made. So true. And I think when, uh, you know, you're a young professional who's just starting to make money, you know, if you went to college, like <laughs> moving out of those broke college days, if that was a situation you were in, um, you know, it, it can feel really empowering to have money. And in a lot of times we're thinking about the now and not planning for the long term, right? And I am always somebody who says like, you never think the worst is going to happen to you until it actually happens to you, which is why you need to plan for the worst to happen to you in the case that it does. Because right. no one ever wakes up thinking, I'm going to get hit by a bus until, you know, you know somebody or you see a case in the news that it happens and you're like, oh, wow, it actually could happen to me, right? Right. Um, and, and so I would, I'd love for you to just touch a little bit about, you know, the importance of longevity planning, as I read in your bio, that you're a really big advocate for that. And I think especially for women and those who identify as women, um, this is something that we don't tend to talk about enough. So I'd love for you to touch on that briefly. Well, a lot of the work that I do, a lot of the presentations I create and what I write um, have been ideas that came to me because I'm living it. My mother is 96 years old. That's longevity. Her sister died last summer at age 97. And when I started in the industry, when we did insurance illustrations, life insurance illustrations, we'd often run them out or make the assumption that the person would live to like 85. Now we have to make the assumption that the person unless there's some health issue, that they're gonna to live to 100, maybe longer. Well, if you have to make money last for years and years after you retire, if you work outside the home, then you better focus on what do I need to do in order to have a portfolio that actually is focused on appreciating over the long term while potentially throwing off some income currently if I have to use that income to supplement any retirement income I have. So the longevity, it's not about retirement anymore. Retirement is just a phase, okay? How many phases do we have in our lives? It's, it's an event. I retired. Okay, now I got 30 or 40 years left where I have to figure out what I'm going to do and how I'm going to pay for that. That's important, really important. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because, you know, I live in, in Argentina and after you retire, after you've completed a certain amount of time, they guarantee you like a really big percentage of your salary, right? So it could, I think it's up to 82% that they guarantee you for the rest of your life where, you know, we don't have those systems in the US. Um, and, and it's so important to think about that and be cognizant of it because I, I think it's so easy going back to that, but like thinking in the now and thinking, oh, well, it's fine. And then when you get to that time, you're like, okay, I really should have invested more. And it's a lot harder to go back and, you know, take from the little that you have left. Um, so thank you for touching on that. 
you're totally um, right. I mean, we don't have, and I'll call it not pejoratively, but we don't have that safety net. Yes, we have social security, but as you know, our political system is, you know, divided and some folks are really anti, anti the government paying anything and other people believe that the government needs to step up. So I don't see a time where we'll be able to get 82% of what our wages were when we were working. Um, I think that would help a lot because people are not prepared in terms of what they put away for for their longevity, for the rest of their life. And when you think about it, Nicole, in some cases, people will be retired longer than they worked. I mean, Mind that's not, not the case for me, kiddo, because I would have to die at like age 120. But anyway, <laughs> um, um, it's true, it's true. And, and baby boomers now, and in fact, I, I assume you're a millennial, right? Yes, thank you. Yes, you're lucky. I'm not. Uh, baby <laughs> boomers now are healthier and mm. don't want to necessarily wind it down. Um, I'm like the oldest woman at my firm. And mm. it doesn't, that's fine with me. But when I got into the business, I remember my sales trainer telling me, not to meet a potential client in person because he or she would think I was selling Girl Scout cookies. So in terms of age issues, I've kind of lived both sides of it. Um, but I don't foresee myself winding down unless somebody winds me down. You are really spruising up my, my evening here. Thank you so much for this conversation. And I, I love your honesty and your transparency here. I think it, it, it's so needed, um, especially when talking about such like a heavy topic, right? Like talking about these things and trying to look at our budgets and, and all of this. And I want to talk about you living an on-purpose life, right? doing rewarding and meaningful work and getting to do all the other things that you really love to do. I mean, the part about you being a silversmith, that's incredible. Um, but you know, can you talk about that? How has, how have you been able to live an on, on purpose life at work, working at Thornburg? And what does that mean for you to live an on purpose life? Well, you know, typically when someone gets to about age 50 and it doesn't have to be right on the 50 year mark, but somewhere around there, they step back and they say, what's my life about? What am I doing? Why am I doing it? What have I made of myself? Well, you know what happened last year, Nicole, is that that age 50 thing went out the window because being locked down and all that type of thing, more people than ever were stepping back and saying, Ooh, I don't think I like being an accountant or being a teacher or whatever their profession. Um, and they want to do what they want to do. And on purpose has to do with why I live my life. I would contend that one of the reasons why my mother and her sister have had such long lives is because they've had a purpose. Now, you know, their purpose may be grandchildren, great grandchildren, it may be friends, that type of thing. Um, my purpose happens to be nature and the mountains and my dogs, and my family. So I live in Santa Fe where Thornburg is headquartered and I'm in the mountains essentially. I, when I can in a normal year, not a pandemic year, I like to ski once a week at least. Um, I go hiking. Uh, there's something about the mountains that really rejuvenates me. And I think people have that about the ocean. I've never heard anybody say that they have that about the wheat fields. Okay, that's not, that's not a thing. But um, so I'm here. I'm in the mountains. Uh, I promised myself when I left Minnesota and left behind my 96-year-old mother, who wasn't nine when I came to Thornburg 12 years ago, but my three kids, their significant others, and now their three grandchildren, one on the way, 
You know what I mean? It's like a bunch of rabbits, but that's a different story. Um, and I'm doing for me what's important. Part of that includes trying to get back to Minnesota at least a week, a month. And some of my friends are like, I've never seen anybody do that, where you go home once a month. Well, you know, I'm very close to my mother. Um, I don't want to regret um, not having been there or believing that it's not important to spend time with my kids. I think that um, even my grandchildren, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of children. I just had three. I think I know where they came from. But once I had them, oh my God, I love them. And I love them even more now. And their kids are, it's amazing. And it actually gives me energy and gives me life. So purpose is about what makes my soul happy or shine or feel like I'm not wasting my life. And I believe that's what people want, as opposed to being forced into some career that their father always told them they'd be a doctor. So now they're a doctor and they, they actually want to be a sculptor. So the purpose is about being a sculptor, not being a doctor, if that's not what you want to do. Financial security and financial wherewithal can help ensure that people have the option of doing what they want to do and living their life with and on purpose. You make so many incredible points. Um, as somebody who lives very far from my family, as I live in Buenos Aires, Argentina, you know, <laughs> I wish I could get home once a, once a month because I, I think I think being far away also makes you appreciate that even more, right? Because it's it, it's a lot easier to not lose sight of the value of that, but definitely being abroad has brought me closer to my family and has, you know, made me want to spend more time with them and, and talk to them on the phone more, you know, what have you. Um, and, and so thank you for bringing that up. But also, you know, there, I think there's a freedom that's really come from this pandemic with so many jobs moving from in office to remote. And we're seeing this sort of boom in, you know, freelancing, this gig economy, like it, it's really changing the, the idea of what work meant. And then, of course, you know, the facility that people have to move abroad now, as I live abroad, and, and globalization and companies hiring abroad and I think it's such a beautiful thing because I feel like as a society, more and more, we're moving towards valuing that life of living on purpose and, and saying like, I don't want to just work, work, work until I retire and then start to live my life. I want to live right. my life in the now, you know? And, and so we had a follow-up question that came in about this idea that said, how do you live an on-purpose life for today, but financially plan for the future? And I'm going to add on to that. If you are planning to move away from your full-time job into the sort of freelance gig economy, um, how should you financially plan? Well, again, that's where an advisor comes in. Um, financial advisors, if you bring it, boil it down to basics, what they do is get to know you and help you articulate what you want and what's important to you in life. And then they quantify that for you. For example, if you say, I love Italy, I wanna live in Italy, I wanna own a home in Italy, then, and you know, when do you wanna do it? Well, in 2032, so, you look at the cost of homes in Italy for the kind that you'd be interested in. And then you determine what you would need to put away today in order to get to that goal. The financial planning thing and the goal, it's a balancing act. There are short-term goals, medium term, a short term would be defined as like under a year medium-term uh, goals, 
two to five years, and then long-term goals, five years and longer. Usually it's longer than that, like 10 years probably. And you have to balance things. And that's what happens, for example, when someone gets married and either adopts or has a child, all of a sudden, then there are other goals that come into play that you were never thinking of, like educating the child. And how do we want to plan for that? Um, not everybody can get on a pair of skis like Lindsey Vaughn at age two and become a you know, World Cup champion or get on the golf course like Tiger Woods uh, and hit a drive 200 yards when you're eight years old. So it has to be realistic and the planning is what's critical. And when you plan, there are trade-offs. There are trade-offs. If, for example, you have a child, um, and honestly, I never wanted any kids. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Don't send this to my children. Well, actually, they know that. But once they were in my life, it became apparent to me how important they were. And I wouldn't have been thinking, oh, when I have, when we have children, this is what we need to do to plan for the children. They kind of showed up and you had to kind of switch gears right, you know, while you're already moving forward. And that will happen all through somebody's life. Things will happen that aren't expected. Uh, things will happen that aren't expected that are heartbreaking, but are also heart filling. So um, you just have to know that you can't totally map it out from day one. Mm. Things will come in and throw your planning off a little bit and you have to readjust and continue moving forward. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Jan, this has been such an incredible conversation. I can't wait to follow up with you. Um, so can you tell us where we can follow you, where we can follow up with you in this last minute that we have and support you? Um, I have many things that I've written on Thornburg. So it's on thorn thornburg.com. Uh, I have a podcast called hashtag now me. And it's actually about individuals, instead of focusing on everybody around them, taking the time and saying, okay, what do I want out of life? As far as I know, we get one chance at this. So we've got to make it the life that we want. And one that will make us feel like there's nothing we re regret when we get to the point where we go to wherever that is in the future, life number two or whatever. But I'm not coming back as a mosquito. <laughs> well, Jen, I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Thornburg for sponsoring this conference, for having you here speaking on their behalf. It's been so incredible. You are such a character. I, I resonate with so many things that you said. Um, so thank you so much. And I hope that you have an incredible evening. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you for the great work you're doing. Appreciate you and your organization. Awesome. Well, what a great conversation with tons of humor. And so I am feeling super re-energized. 